What struck me more than anything was just the power of a place that has been built on the walked prayers of so many thousands and thousands and millions of people. I took this picture because this was um, etched into the stones as we entered Santiago. I took a picture of the, the English phrase. It was in many different languages, but it says Europe was made on the pilgrim road to Compostela. And if you take this to heart, what that really means to me is that walking, you know, moving actively, being, it's the human movement that has built our places. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns Podcast. My name is John Zimmerman and that is Darcy Kitching from Boulder, Colorado. We are going to be talking about her new job in transportation demand management, TDM. We're also going to talk about her recent trip on the Camino Santiago. Uh, so let's get right to it with Darcy. Darcy Kitching, so wonderful to have you back on the Active Towns Podcast. Welcome. Thank you, John. I'm so glad to be here. Darcy, you've been on the podcast a couple of times. I profiled you a few times out on my YouTube channel uh, for other various activities there in Boulder. But why don't you just take uh, this opportunity just to introduce yourself? Who is Darcy? Sure. Hi, well, I'm Darcy Kitching, and I am a transportation professional here in the city of Boulder. I work with a group called Boulder Transportation Connections. I'm also a researcher and an active uh, pedestrian advocate. I manage or kind of oversee a group called the Boulder Ramblers. We're an urban hiking group, and that is the group that John has so beautifully profiled and um, featured on your channel. So thank you so much. There's a lot of wonderful stuff happening here in Boulder, and I'm so delighted to be part of it. Fantastic. Yes, exactly. And uh, what's really cool since the last time we've had uh, the opportunity to talk with you here on the channel is you have a new job. I Which do. Is cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a great job. <laughs> tell us more. Tell, tell us about uh, about what you do. Well, you know, it's exciting because I'm, I've entered this very specific niche of transportation called transportation demand management, which sounds super wonky. Oh, totally. Um, yeah. and, <laughs> and it is, you know, I mean, it's really, it's a very specific niche. It's all about helping the city of Boulder meet its own goals to uh, reduce single occupant vehicle trips to reduce greenhouse gases, to get people moving and making different transportation choices, but really ultimately what transportation demand management as a profession is all about is maximizing the current um, transportation systems that we have so that we're not building new lanes for cars. We're maintaining the infrastructure that we have, and we're actually adding more infrastructure for activity. So this is where you and I really connect beautifully is that, you know, we both of us are so out there in the world, t helping people walk and bike and take transit and, you know, move actively through their towns and, and link up with others who are doing that and who love to do that and who want to learn more about how to do that in the course of their daily lives. So that's really what, you know, there's an acronym that goes with this called TDM. And that's really what this, this niche within transportation is all about. How do we maximize the, the transportation uh, infrastructure and systems that we already have and then build on the capacity for activity within those so that we're incentivizing and providing space for more bicycling, more walking, more transit use. And here in Colorado, it's actually been really super exciting lately because just last week, I don't know um, how uh, up on commuter rail or passenger rail you are, but uh, the Front Range Passenger Rail District was just selected as one of just a handful of projects around the country um, for federal funding for more planning activities to um, determine whether this Front Range Passenger Rail District, which runs, uh, you know, potentially will be running intercity rail between Fort Collins and Pueblo, Colorado, all along the Front Range, including Boulder. You know, our governor, Jared Polis, is 
is from Boulder and has been a strong advocate to bring commuter rail and um, intercity passenger rail to Colorado. And this is something, you know, it's in our history. It's in kind of our DNA. And um, we've, you know, like a lot of places over the past many years, we have let our uh, transportation infrastructure really be dominated by um, auto travel and, you know, vehicles. So we're trying to bring back this wonderful tradition of passenger rail. And so that's that's a big project that we're actually helping to advocate for at uh, Boulder Transportation Connections. We've been involved in those conversations and have been facilitating some of them in our own meetings. And um, to me, that's one of the most exciting things that we've been involved in lately. And of course, you know, big conversations with our regional transportation district, um, helping to provide, uh, you know, bus service and advocating for the return of bus service to our transit-oriented development, which currently is not served by transit. So there's a lot going on here and a lot of really fun and exciting projects that I'm just so pleased to be part of. I've been really grateful to be able to, to do this work in the city where I live as well. So I um, have the great, uh, the, the good fortune of living and working in the same city. So I don't have a big commute. I work from home frequently, which is another thing that TDM really advocates for is, you know, telework. How do we just not travel when we don't need to? So not traveling is a way to, you know, keep cars off the streets as well. So I often work from home. Um, our organization is housed at the Boulder Chamber of Commerce. So I get to go into the Boulder Chamber and be part of those exciting activities. Um, the Boulder Chamber is the second largest uh, Chamber of Commerce in the state of Colorado. And there's just so much fun and exciting stuff going on. And I get to bring all my skills and interests to this work. So it's really, it's really fun. And, and I'm really grateful for it. Yeah. I love the way that you phrase that too, is like really trying to uh, lean into activating what's already there and the yes. processes and the infrastructure and the systems that are already there and really trying to maximize utilization of them. Uh, yes, of course, we need to uh, build better infrastructure and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I think you've got a, a little video on a slip lane, so we'll talk about some yes. infrastructure <laughs> stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's like, and so in, in, in the active towns terminology, you've heard me say, that we've got the hardware, which is our built environment. You know, these are the activity assets that are the hardware, our bike lanes and our, you know, sidewalks and the things that are built in our environment. Uh, these are the things that we can put a pin in a map and say, yeah, we've got a park over there. We've got a protected bike lane over here. We've got a public pool over there. And, you know, these are, 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 are these assets that we have in our community, but it's these activity assets that are the software that bring them to life. And that's what you are doing. And that's, and, and that's part of it. And, and some of the activities include initiatives. So, so these are a series of photos uh, that you have put out on, on Instagram actually uh, associated with, uh, with, with, this particular initiative, talk about this initiative. And was this initiative a, a, a nationwide, a worldwide initiative, or is this just for Boulder and Colorado? Well, this was exciting. So I took the, I had just taken a bite of breakfast. So that's why my face looks like that. <laughs> While I was waiting for the bus, I looked a little funny, but the bus was right there and I had to step a picture. Um, so this was the first day, I believe, of the National Week Without Driving, which was actually a collaboration between um, America Walks and an organization in Washington State, the name of which escapes me at the moment, but um, you can slip that in here. Um, this was the first nationwide uh, week without driving. So it had started a couple of years ago in the state of Washington, but America Walks helped bring it nationwide. I do some consulting work for America Walks. So that was kind of my entree into this uh, this week. And it was so exciting. So it was the whole first week of October, which also happens to be my birthday week. So I had a lot of fun taking the bus bicycling and walking to work every day that week. The pictures you're showing are, are scenes that I captured from the week. So this was my walk to get lunch from the, the um, Chamber of Commerce. This was the bus ride home. Uh, the Co Chamber of Commerce building is a couple slides back. We've got this beautiful mural on the oh, side right. of the yeah. Chamber of Commerce that was done um, in conjunction with an organization in Boulder called Streetwise Arts, which produces amazing work and partners with local artists. Um, to and so that was really 
really was day two, yeah. day one or something like that? I believe I, you know, I don't remember. You have my feet up here. So let's see. <laughs> oh, second day. Yeah. So that was the, the second, second day. day. And yeah. then the third day was um, the uh, national walk and or bike and roll to yes, school the, day. Yes, national walk and rolls to school day. Yes. Perfect. I said, walk and roll. That's right. Bike, bike day is in April. Yeah. So walk and roll to school day, which I have been a part of at my son's school for the past five years. He's in fifth grade now. So this is our last year, but I have pledged to continue to oversee this event for Mesa because we live so close. It is so much fun. So the district provides some snacks. They provide this poster that the kids can sign. Our elementary school is unique in that we have this amazing coffee cart. You just showed a picture. <laughs> you should go back to the coffee cart. It was amazing. Um, we have this fantastic coffee cart that two that an Italian family uh, who has come to our school um, they volunteered at an event a couple of years ago to provide espresso, and we they ended up getting a grant to buy this. <laughs> It's this coffee cart with two espresso machines. So now we bring and, it out with every event. And to, and so to be sure, the and to be sure, the coffee is really yeah. for the 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 parents. It's not for yeah. the little ones. Yes, no, no, it's for the parents. But how great, right? Because it's something that invites. It just it's an activity asset, right? Yes, yes. More people are willing to escort their children to school on the days when the coffee cart is out. You get this wonderful sense of community where people gather. I mean, imagine yeah. if we had coffee carts in more yeah. places. So here I am just thrilled and happy, throwing up my arms in delight because it was so much fun. Yeah. It's always a really great event. I mean, kids just mob that table. Oh, I bake these cookies in the shape of pedestrians every year. So they get to, they get to eat pedestrian cookies. Yep. <laughs> That's one of my favorite things to do. And kids just love them. Cannibals, just I tell you, sugar. they're cannibals. I know, cannibals. <laughs> <laughs> they're just plain sugar cookies, but they love them. Yeah. And so I make those for the kids every year. Um, so I'm going to keep doing this, even though this is my last, my son's last year at, at our local elementary school. It's just a couple blocks from our house. And so that's another thing that, you know, I really take to heart. And it's super important to me that I live in a place where my son can walk to school. And this was not a given. I lived in this neighborhood uh, with my family. And then last year I got divorced and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to stay in the neighborhood, but I did my best. And I found a unit that was perfect for me and my son very close to our family home. So, you know, it all worked out so that he can keep walking to school every day. And all three levels of school are within a, a very small block radius of our home. So he can go to middle school next year by foot. He can go to high school after that by foot. And I'm so grateful. So this is, I mean, it's a real privilege that I have living in this part of Boulder. So let's talk a little bit about that challenge of, of trying to minimize the number of car trips that you had to take during a week. Um, it's, it's hard. I mean, our, hard. Our, our built <laughs> environment, our society is not set up to make it really easy you know, it, it, it depends, you know, it really depends on what your situation is. Um, I happen to be in a situation where I rarely have to drive. And so the car just kind of sits there and then, you know, then it's available when I need to drive up to Boulder to see you and, and the rest of the, uh, of the friends up there. But talk a little bit about that experience because you were really intentional and you were really trying. And at the end of the week, you learned some lessons and, I know you're going to talk about it later or write about it at some point yeah. in time, but yes, I don't have time. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Well, the National Week Without Driving was also designed because it was started by a disability rights adv um, advocacy organization in Washington State. It's really about empathy more than anything else. So um, the Denver Streets Partnership really took this took this up and did a lot of great events in Denver. So here in Boulder, I wanted to take the spirit of, of that and um, think about, you know, the question was, what if you couldn't drive? There are so many people in our um, communities who don't have the ability to drive. And because, as you just said, because our communities are so built around car um, access and dependence, we take it for granted so often that the car is there. It's something we can do. I happen to live on a really good bus line. I have an e-bike. I mean, I don't have any excuse 
not to leave the car at home most of the time, right? Um, this, these were some of the events that um, I attended during the week. That's uh, Jonathan Stahls, the founder of Walk to Connect in the middle there. That's an organization I was a partner in for many years. Um, Jill Locantor on the right, who's the head of the Denver Streets Partnership, and our dear friend um, Don on the left. So uh, that was great. We went to see the screening of um, a film. And of course, the name of the film just uh, escaped me at the moment, but we can put that in the show notes. Um, it was a really amazing film about, about the importance of safe streets. So, you know, this is the thing. So many people live in places where it isn't safe uh, to walk or bike or where they just, they just can't. I mean, we know looking at the Nas National Household uh, Travel Survey and other sources of data that people who have physical disabilities often travel at very low rates and they often have very low incomes as well. So people, uh, so a lot of people, and you know, we have this epidemic of loneliness in our culture where so many people are just kind of trapped at home or they're not able to get out and experience their, you know, their communities the way that I was here. So this was a video I took while I was biking um, down 13th street in Boulder, which I just love. This was a day that my, I had my son on the back of the bike and we were biking up to, his favorite arcade. So um, this was something that that I that I'm 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 grateful and lucky to be able to do. I'm so fortunate. I mean, I I have the physical capability to walk and bike. I have the um, assets themselves, you know, an e-bike, and um, and I live in a place that has invested in really good infrastructure. This particular bike lane may not be the most exemplary, the but best. you know, it's yeah. it's doable yeah. because this is also uh, one of what we call our neighborhood green streets. So it's a pretty slow traffic street, and it's a, uh, a pretty quiet street. So it feels safe to to bike down. And there we are at the arcade, his favorite place. It's called Gateway Fun Park. And so we we biked all the way up there. And that was the first time I had ever done that. I don't know if you have the video of the danger that if you, if you want to show that. I mean, it it was that last little connection. So it's a little way into the, here we go. So the last little connection to this place where my son loves to go is terrifying. This is a really wide highway. It's four lanes, two lanes on each side, and there's no crossing at this natural, you see these bicyclists. So I, I was filming this to see where's that bicyclist going to go. And here we had to come into this facility on the north side of the highway. There's no good bike access to this place. I certainly would not want to try to walk across the highway. That would be even more terrifying. But there were people on bicycles crossing and I did the same. And it was, boy, that was the most harrowing moment I think I've ever had on a bike. <laughs> so, um, but you know, it, it, it goes to show that like we have really good infrastructure here and I'm grateful for that. Um, and there are those missing pieces, those places where it's just hard, they're hard edges, you know? Yeah. Um, and Especially they also- trying to get to especially trying to get to meaningful destinations like meaningful a, destinations a for families yeah. Yeah. exactly so many families come to this place every day it's open every single day of the year right and um, they don't even have bike parking the bike parking the bike rack that I found there was totally unusable I could not figure it out um, and then a neighbor told me how it works but it wouldn't have worked for my bike anyway so I you know I and another e-bike rider just chained our bikes to the um to the fence so there was somebody else who was brave who brought their kid on the back of their bike my bike is the red bike in the back so somebody else <laughs> also braved that that harrowing intersection yeah and uh, you bring up a good point too on uh, that particular intersection and that particular street. Um, it, it, it actually is a highway. It's a state highway. It's Highway 36. And so it's the main uh, highway that uh, heads on up along the, the front range, making your way to the uh, gateway to Rocky Mountain National Park and to, uh, to Lyons and then on up to Estes Park. And so it's one of the challenges that many cities have is they have these state highways that run right through the middle of their cities and right past um, schools and right past parks and right past meaningful destinations like these fun zones. And, and yeah, it, it makes it very, very challenging. So what I like about you having gotten this job, you know, and, and taken the plunge into uh, this work that you're so passionate about and and having gone through this week and learned these lessons is that it's really easy for us as 
you know, as intellectuals thinking about these things and talking about these things. And in your case, you're researching these things. It's really easy for us to get into onto our high horse and pontificate about things and, and da, 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 and, and all that. But when we have to live it and like do a challenge like this, it suddenly, we like really become empathetic to the challenges of other families, especially with, you know, parents. Yeah. Well, and especially, I mean, imagine if you were trying to negotiate these places in a wheelchair, even a, you know, a powered wheelchair. Um, We have friends here locally who are uh, wheelchair users and, you know, who who really get in their bones and in their muscles that when you're heading west in Boulder, you're going uphill. And that presents a challenge and there are trips you might avoid because you don't want to roll yourself uphill, you know? So it is, you know, you have to be really conscious of the um, the environment. I, I so appreciated the way that the National Week Without Driving was framed around empathy um, for people with, with uh, physical disabilities, really trying to understand and take to heart the, um, the challenges that people face every day and making environments and our society better for them. Yeah. And you had mentioned transit and taking transit and leveraging and leaning into uh, transit. And, you know, in my time living in Boulder and also the many times that I that I visit there, I just love that magic combination of being able to uh, have my folding bike, my Brompton, jump on the bus or jump on the train. Being able to take transit really just makes things so much easier Oftentimes I do have my car with me because I've done a road trip, you know, up from, from Austin to Boulder. But once I get there, I don't want to get in the car again. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I would much rather ride my bike or, or take, take transit. Talk a little bit about that because that's one of the things that your group is really trying to help people with, because if, if somebody hasn't ever used transit before, it can be a bit scary. It can be. And there is a um, there's kind of a way of helping people learn about transit called travel training that our county partners are really great at. We have friends at this uh, department in the county called Mobility for All, and they are fantastic at travel training and really helping people orient to um, to uh, transit and bus travel. And especially for people with um, disabilities and people who um, really are transit dependent um, at Boulder Transportation connections, we try to, you know, we're work, working with employers and people who work in Boulder to get eco passes, which is our local um, bus pass, you know, just a uh, perennial bus pass. And that picture that you were showing was from our Electrify October event, which was so fun. We were really highlighting the benefits of electric um, vehicles, specifically transit. So our um, that's our wonderful uh, mayor and chamber president president there, uh, or Mayor Aaron Brockett on the on the uh, right. And then the, we also had a hydrogen, yeah, sorry, we also had a hydrogen vehicle there, which is interesting. This hydrogen vehicle um, happens to be used on the campus of the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden. Um, and so we had a lot of people visiting. We really focused on e-bikes here as well, but the bus was um, from Via Mobility, which is based in Boulder, and they are ramping up their electric bus fleet. It's amazing. They are um, ramping up to nine or 12 vehicles. I forget exactly how many, but they're really pushing the electric buses, which is great. And so the woman who um, was standing in front of the bus, her name is Christine. She's a driver. She loves driving that electric bus because it's quiet. She talked about the difference between driving a diesel bus and driving the electric bus. And I loved her story. She was so charismatic. She's like, that electric bus, the kids love it. I love it. Everybody loves the electric bus because we can talk to each other and it's fun. <laughs> you know, she was just so animated and wonderful. And what a great thing, right? To love your job because you're driving a quiet, comfortable vehicle and you're serving um, people's needs. So that the hot bus is one, it's a circulator here in Boulder that goes around downtown. It serves uh, students at the University of Colorado. It serves older adults. It serves everybody who just wants to, you know, get on and off that circular uh, route that it does. So it's a really great um, asset that we have here. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned the eco pass, uh, there and, and I think that it, it's important to really highlight and emphasize that 
um, there is that option available that you all are working with to try to connect employers uh, to the their employees that could benefit from from having the eco pass. Yeah, for this sure. This is my eco pass. I don't think you yeah. can really see it. It's too bright, but yeah, it's, too it's, bright. <laughs> it's now a um, it's a mobile. Um, EcoPass now. So our um, regional transportation district, RTD, they are switching everybody over to mobile passes. And those who can't uh, use a mobile pass on a smartphone can still use a MyRide card. So we're doing a lot of those transitions right now at Boulder Transportation Connections, helping people get those passes activated. And, you know, we emphasize to employers that even if people aren't commuting by bus, the EcoPass is an incredible benefit. In fact, it's one of the most cost effective benefits that any employer can provide because there are so many incentives right now to that discounts. We have a, a state um, alternative transportation options tax credit, which is amazing. So there, this is an incredible time for businesses in the Boulder area and all over Colorado to invest in transit passes. So even if your employers only or your employees only use it to get to the airport at the holidays, you know, it still pays for itself, which is amazing. So it's something that everybody can use at, at some point. Yeah. And uh, I know that we've, we've got a few images here. Here's uh, the uh, Boulder Depot uh, site and the RTD uh, station that they have there. Now, this did get shut down for a while due to the pandemic. It had been up and running um, prior to uh, uh, 2020. Um, it, it, am I correct in hearing that it's about ready to get started again or, or has it already reopened? Well, this is part of what we are strongly advocating for. So um, this is Boulder Junction Station. Boulder Junction is Boulder's newest neighborhood, and it is a transit-oriented development. And before the pandemic, there were about um, four bus lines, bus routes serving this station, uh, one to the airport, one to downtown Denver, um, a couple of neighborhood routes. And actually, I think there were two to Denver uh, and a neighborhood route. So it was uh, service to Boulder Junction was stopped in 2020. They prioritized service elsewhere and it has not resumed yet. So we have been strongly advocating for RTD to return um, at least two of those bus routes to the station. Um, the FF4 that goes to uh, Denver's Civic Center Station and the AB two, I believe. I forget. It's the, the I think um, that's what it airport was. Yeah. bus. Yeah, yeah the eighty two yeah. goes to the airport. Um, at least those two. So this neighborhood is being built out right now. There are already thousands of people who live in this neighborhood, but more buildings. If I had taken, if I had turned around and taken a picture on the west side of, of the street here, you'd see all these buildings under construction. Yeah, in fact, and, if we I mean, if we zoom thousands, out of this, if we zoom yeah. out of this too, you'll see that the, all the buildings in this area are just like this. They are, you know, oh, four and different. five story. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah they're they're four, four, it's, four a, it's a high density story. neighborhood, but there are different styles and it's a really, it's a really cool urban neighborhood. You know, it's, there's a lot going on there and it's a really interesting place. And I'm super excited about it. I was actually on a community focus group for Boulder Junction phase two. Um, I think it's just a fascinating project and something that we really need to invest in. And so bringing transit back to our transit oriented development, which is something that our governor, Jared Polis is really emphasizing in his budget for next year. You know, that, that piece of making sure that transit is accessible, attainable, is consistent and reliable, those are the things that are going to help people move into and choose to live in these kinds of neighborhoods. Now, what you're showing here are pictures that I took during a, a tour, um, an e-bike tour that we, our, my organization um, and uh, another organization hosted, uh, Community Cycles and a couple others, hosted um, during the week without driving for the Transportation Legislation Review Committee, which is uh, a group of state legislators who are, you know, all informed about the 
transportation legislation that's that's up for review. And so they came up to Boulder and we gave them a wonderful um, e-bike tour. And I think I included a little video. It was so cute. They, they, everybody was on a B-Cycle, which is our local bike share organization. And uh, they were all loving the little bells, you know, and having a good time. And um, we showcased the infrastructure between Boulder Junction and the Boulder Chamber. So where I work. So that was, um, it was a really fun tour. And we stopped at community cycles along the way and um, looked at some of those fun projects. Here's the video of, of them. So this is one of the little bulb outs on um, Spruce Street, Spruce. I think it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is Spruce. Yeah. One of the interesting things too about uh, that location, the Boulder Junction location is, is we were looking at the old original train depot that's yeah. why it's called the Boulder <laughs> Depot. That's the, the original Depot, yeah. uh, train building. And it has mm -hmm. been uh, rebuilt in that location. It's mm -hmm. it's actually been taken down and rebuilt multiple times. It's, I'm it's sure. Kind of, <laughs> it's, it's been all over the place, all over the city. Yeah. Um, but the reason why it's there and the reason why the, that neighborhood was built up as a TOD where it was is that is the location where we do um, expect to have the rail stop. That would be where, um, you know, that that rail that we, you were referencing and the, the rail that uh, that we voted for way back in 2004 uh, when I was still living in, in Niwot, um, because Niwot would have also been one of the train stops. And it's one of the original whistle stops, uh, you know, on on rail in the area. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed that this actually does happen. Oh, right. Fingers crossed. I mean, it really would be an incredible, um, an incredible asset. So uh, we're, you know, we're, we're all for it. And I hope that it continues to develop successfully. Yeah, well, let's leverage those federal dollars and make it happen. So you mentioned the AB bus and being able to get to the airport. And that was, that's always one of my favorite ways of getting to and from the airport when I do fly and I do uh, fly every, every once in a while. Sometimes I'll, I'll drive up and leave the car there and then fly home. And then uh, after a month or so, uh, you know, fly back. And, and so when I do fly, um, I can't remember the last time I was in a motor vehicle, you know, going to and from the airport. Oh, you don't uh, you want know. to drive to the airport. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's like, it's so easy to do that. But so you're, you're all packed up and ready to go here. Where, where are you headed? That's right. So at the end of October, I mean, October was an incredible month for me. So this is why I really do need to devote some time to an article about all these adventures, because at the end of October, this was October 21st, I took the bus to the, um, airport with my backpack. I think I had a 15 pound, 36 liter backpack uh, packed with everything I needed for a week long trip on the Camino de Santiago in Spain. I walked the last 120 kilometers, so about 90 miles um, of the, the Camino. It was fantastic. We walked between the cities of Saria and Santiago, and that's the arguably the most beautiful, most ancient part of the Camino Frances, which starts at um, St. John in France. So we met a lot of people along the way who had started in St. John and were walking the full 500 miles. And I would give anything to have a month to go and walk the full 500 miles, but I don't have a month right now to do that. So I took a week and walked the last, uh, the last 90 miles and it was it was just incredible, right? So we started in Saria, which is um, I don't see it on here. It's probably a little too small. It's um, just past Leon, uh, past uh, around Astorga. So yeah, so we walked that last little section, and it was quite quite the adventure. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I I love this this map too. <laughs> this is a fun that's one. That's a cool one. Yeah, <laughs> there and you can yeah. see all the. Yes, Caminos, right? There are yeah, well, there's a bunch of them. Yes, yeah. so many different routes. You can even yeah. take a boat from England, you know, and that still counts as doing the Camino. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You have your yeah. little passport. I should have taken a picture of my little passport, you know, and you get stamps along the way. You stop, and uh, yeah. you have to get at least two stamps a day in your passport, and you have to walk at least a hundred kilometers, or you have to travel at least a hundred kilometers to get your official stamp in Santiago at the cathedral. And so I, I was yeah. grateful you, to be able to get do there. that. So, so you mentioned, uh, you know, you mentioned Lyon and so, uh, you know, we, 
this gives us a little bit of an idea of some of the, the city locations and what they, these look like. So I took these pictures to show, specifically to illustrate the mix of uses, but also the mix of modes. One of the most distinctive characteristics of all these old cities in Spain, um, and this was all in Galicia, which is sort of northwestern Spain, but, you know, this is reminiscent of any old European city, right? You see the same kinds of things where in the old part of the city, you've got narrow streets that are populated mostly by people. And vehicles are not necessarily prohibited. In some places they are, but in some places they are allowed, but they are guests. And we've talked about this before. And I know that many of your guests on this podcast have really emphasized that, how important it is to design places, at least central places, where people dominate and cars are guests. Um, And so delivery vehicles, or, you know, personal vehicles like this one, um, who are trying to get to a hotel or trying to get to work or whatever, they're just super, super slow. And this is a maximum of 20 kilometers an hour. I mean, super slow, right? Like 10 or 15 miles an hour. Um, This was in um, Leon. This was an incredibly... I I loved this city so much because the old, the ancient medieval walls of this city are still largely intact. In many places, you know, those walls, there there is the pattern of where the wall was, but not necessarily the wall itself. So this is the actual original um, or part of the original city wall. And I took this picture again to show here are these beautiful cobblestone streets. There are vehicles that can go in there, but they are mostly populated by people and people have the widest areas um, to to traverse. They have, they dominate, they are um, the first and foremost occupants of that space. And people who are driving just have to creep along and be patient. I heard no horn honking. I, um, and, you know, I saw some really interesting things too, in this city and others, we went to Burgos, we went to Leon and other places. I saw cars like drive into the first floor of buildings. There are some really um, unassuming garages, you know, some interesting places. This was in Burgos. uh, And I took this picture because this is a trash truck, you know, our and it, imagine, I mean, this is the size of a van, you know, a, a normal American like minibus, right? And it, it had a, a, you know, a backside that was all like, you know, open. And here's one of the workers on the left. And um, these streets are quite narrow. And they're, they've got these nice pavers and everything. And so this this truck is just um, traveling very respectfully through that area. They're collecting trash from the bins, putting it in the back of the truck and moving on. You know, it, it, to me, it, it just perfectly illustrated how, you know, we, we get so hung up on the size of our vehicles. You know, our emergency vehicles are massive. Um, our waste vehicles are massive. And that, the size of those vehicles actually dictates the width of our streets. So we have to start downsizing our emergency vehicles and our waste vehicles and other service vehicles so that we can downsize our And maybe our streets even our well. personal vehicles? Maybe even our (laughs) our personal vehicles. This is something I myself did. I don't know if I've told you this story that my my Subaru Outback died. (laughs) So I replaced it with a Honda Fit, which is a tiny little car. And I love it because now I can actually park in my garage and just leave it in there and forget about it. So I love that. (laughs) See, it's out of sight, out of mind. I'll just use my bike. You know, it's so great. (laughs) Right. I love it. And it's, and it's tiny. And that Driving that vehicle, I tell you, has changed my driving habits and has changed my relationship to streets. If more, if, and I'm surrounded by massive trucks and other, you know, vehicles that people love here in, in Boulder. Um, boy, if everybody downsized their cars, we would have a really different relationship to each other. Um, but that last slide, I was trying to document in the cities that we visited the way the different modes interact. So I have this picture of a bicyclist, a, a walker, and a car, all you know, perfectly well getting along in that space and doing this dance um, that was quite, you know, quite slow, quite respectful, and really um, emphasized the the spaces for people. So I was, it was fun to document that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't want it to seem like the Camino was all about uh, the, the the city centers. I, I know Not some of all. those photos you <laughs> took for me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for this conversation. Uh, yeah. So, uh, 
so talk about this experience. I mean, a lot of people talk about this as being almost like a, a spiritual journey. Um, talk a little bit about what your experiences were like as we, you know, scroll through some of these beautiful, uh, you know, images from the trail. Well, the Camino de Santiago and all the Caminos, they are a spiritual journey, however one wants to define that. Because when you set out on foot to traverse a long distance, at least 100 kilometers, you're dedicating yourself to moving at your natural pace. And this brings up all kinds of things. I mean, for me, it was an incredibly healing experience. And being in this beautiful, natural landscape, most of the time. So yes, we traversed cities, we walked through, we had to follow the trail. And the trail is very well marked. There are these shell symbols and yellow arrows that you follow. Um, it's beautifully marked. But you go through agricultural land, you go through these ancient tree tunnels. And I, I uh, shared some of those images with you of just the it, it, you can't help but have a spiritual experience when you're in a place like this, when you're surrounded by trees that are hundreds or thousands of years old, these walls that are ancient, the path itself is carved into the land by millions of feet over you know, a thousand years, right? 2000 years, not 2000 years, you know, a thousand years or so. But there are these symbols along the way that mark your um, distance, the, the kilometers, basically, they, they show you how many kilometers are left to go to Santiago. So they count down as you go. I happen to be there at a very rainy time, it rained every day, but not all day every day. So the benefit of that was that we got these beautiful rainbows. And we had, you know, there was it was misty and it was quiet and it was the end of the season we were there between October 23rd and November 1st we arrived in Santiago on October 31st the eve of All Saints Day so that we could celebrate the Celtic New Year I hadn't known that Galicia in Spain was actually um, the Celtic the origin of the Celtic people. I didn't know that. So Neither the Celtic people came from the Iberian Peninsula and went over to the British Isles. And um, how amazing, you know, when you say Galicia, you're saying, you know, the Gauls, so Charles de Gaulle and all that, you know, the these there were these Celtic symbols everywhere. They're very proud of that history. And so it was it was spiritual in that way as well, because of the the thousands of years of um, of both Celtic and Christian um, patterns and histories in these places and the re the reverence for the natural environment. And I tell you, when we got to Santiago, I mean, these these tree tunnels were just stunning. I could not help but take several pictures every day of the trees and the path itself, because it was so stunningly beautiful. And I just wanted to remember what it felt like in that place and what it smelled like. It was, it was um, rich and earthy and, and humid, you know, and all of these, and, and there were, there were smells of, you know, fruits and, and agricultural scents and really interesting sensory experience. And so I was very present, very much in my body, very reverent. I mean, that's, that's a word that keeps coming up for me because when you're, when you're, doing a trip like this, you're, you're so you're in your body. I wasn't, I mean, people ask me, Oh, did you listen to podcasts or whatever? No, I had no earbuds in. I didn't listen to any podcast. You're, you're talking to people along the way. So yes, I was with a small group. We had eight of us with two leaders. Um, that's me on the left with my umbrella. It did rain. And one of my friends here in Boulder who had just done the Camino Primitivo, which is the kind of most challenging route to Santiago, he said, you might want to pack an umbrella, <laughs> a travel umbrella. So I'm glad he told me that because I did. I didn't have to buy one of these giant ponds shows that some of my uh, my fellow peregrinas did. Um, but we all kind of walked at different paces as well. And I was one of the, the two kind of faster walkers. And so most of the time I was on my own. And that experience of being out there on my own, just listening to the sounds of the birds and the rain and the animals and the crunch of the stones under my feet and the sounds, you know, the urban sounds when we went through cities, it was so 
the reverence just resonated, you know, through my whole body. And I'm, I, I have that inclination anyway. I love long walks. I love being in touch with my, my body and my feet and the land around me. This is why I got so involved in Walk to Connect, because I am a person who likes to walk to connect to myself and to others and to the places around me. So that experience to me is very sacred and something that I... I was so grateful to have the time to do. So I was gone for a total of two weeks, but we were walking for one week and um, just got to have that wonderful experience. So when we entered Santiago, what struck me was, you know, of course, the joy of all the people who had walked the full 500 mile Camino Frances, meeting each other in the, the cathedral square and rejoicing and hugging each other and saying hi after, you know, weeks of walking together. What struck me more than anything was just the power of a place that has been built on the walked prayers of so many thousands and thousands and millions of people. I took this picture because this was um, etched into the stones as we entered Santiago. I took a picture of the, the English phrase. It was in many different languages, but it says Europe was made on the pilgrim road to Compostela. And if you take this to heart, what that really means to me is that walking, you know, moving actively, being, it's the human movement that has built our places. And especially, you know, our European um places and other, you know, places in other parts of the world that were similarly built by, by, you know, people on foot, people on horseback, um, creating these narrow uh, pathways, these multi-use districts, these places where everything happens in one place, and it's all accessible to everyone. Um, this was a picture I took of a school street in Santiago. So I went wandering after we had a couple of days there, and I was really grateful to have some time to explore Santiago, which is an absolutely beautiful ancient city. And I loved, I loved exploring it. So on the school street, curiously, there, you know, this was a really nice narrow path, very well marked, and lots of, you know, reminders to drivers to be very slow and respectful. Um, as I was coming around, I did sort of a loop around this street, I was coming around the other side, the very narrow street that led to my hotel was choked with cars having picked up children at the school. <laughs> no, no. No. It looks oh. it looks so great, doesn't it? So yeah. even here oh. in narrow tiny little Santiago, oh. parents are driving their cars and they're sitting in traffic and you're choking on fumes. So this is something that, you know, has happened in some even places that do not facilitate it. Yeah. It's happening. <laughs> It's, it's a universal. So that was a bit I of a mean, disappointment. It, yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's a disappointment, but it's also, a, it, it's it's universal, the challenge that it's, we have. It's the universal yeah. challenge of time, right? This was another thing that we emphasized at Walk to Connect was the importance of slowing our lives down to three miles an hour. For so many people, that just still doesn't feel possible. But what if it did? You know, what if we really could slow our lives down so that we would be walking on these school streets, so that we, we, we would be accompanying our elders and our children and our friends with disabilities so personally, you know? You you knew how excited I was uh, when you told me that you were doing uh, the Camino. And I, I was just tickled to death for you. And, and I knew that you were going to have an amazing time there. Um, but I immediately wanted to know if you were going to be able to get to this place. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, and what is special about Punta Vedra to you? Um, it is well known as uh, a, a city that, you know, where the mayor had fought to push you know, uh, cars out from the, the historic city center. And it's one of the places, and one of my other uh, past uh, guests here on the on the podcast, Kathy Tuttle, had spent uh, quite a bit of time there, had met with uh, the vice mayor, deputy mayor, and spent some time there. And it, to me, it's just a, a truly um, fascinating story. Um, and and it's and it's not a necessarily a new story. It's it's been going on for 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 
many years. I mean, this is a, a, an article by David Zipper uh, back in, in September of 23. And you can see here that, you know, this is a major thing that took place. And so it's, it's not the entire city, of course, the, the, right. but it's the, it's the, it, you know, it's kind of like it is um, in some of these other places, but um, I just love some of the, the classic one-liners from, you know, from the mayor, you know, it, it's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I, I can't, I'll, I'll misquote it, but something along the lines of, you know, just because you have a car doesn't mean you get to store it out here. You know, if, if you have, something you need to put in the refrigerator. I'm not going to provide you with a refrigerator. So, but, Right. Yeah. No, I, I love that. And I really yeah. appreciate that the leadership of this city um, has emphasized the qualities that are inherent to so many of these ancient cities. You know, so I did what prompted me to go to Pontevedra was not even you, John. I don't think you said, hey, you should go to Pontevedra. No, it was actually a friend of mine here in Boulder. Uh, we have, you know, I'm sure that you know of Spencer Havlett. You probably know him. He's a, you know, a retired professor from uh, the University of Colorado who was in environmental design. He's a landscape architect and really still very active. He had been on city council and had advocated for, and I think helped develop many of our multi-use path systems here in Boulder, a real um, advocate for for, uh, places for people. And so a friend of mine, a mutual friend of ours um, had said, oh, hey, you're going to end up in Santiago. You'll be a short train ride away from Pancho Vedra. Why don't you go check it out? And so it was funny because I arranged to do that. I bought a train ticket before I even left on the trip. And I told my fellow, you know, peregrinas on, the, on our trip that I was going to take this train trip. And they said, you know, my, one of the guides was like, why are you going there? It's no different than any other place. And, and so I said, well, I just want to check it out. And, you know, yes, truly. So feel particularly distinctive because I had already walked through several Spanish cities that had very similar characteristics of that, you know, predominantly car-free city center, um, especially Burgos, which actually is still very walled and you can't drive in there at all except for those um, those uh, uh, service vehicles. But it was fun. So first of all, I wanted to take a commuter rail ride because I love riding trains. So I got to do that. And then it was really fun to explore Ponte Vedra. This is the um, Church of the Peregrina. I wanted to go there because, you know, here I was a peregrina, you know, and I wanted to go to this city that had a very feminine orientation to the Camino. Um, this is the Church of the Peregrina. There's also a um, convent adjacent to this church. So I, I wandered in there and happened upon a kind of midday service. And that was beautiful. And um, this is right in the center of the old city. But what was distinctive about this, if you go to some of the first pictures, I think the one that I labeled uh, with a one is, you know, right when I got off the commuter rail train and I uh, left the train station, um, you know, it was so very clearly marked where the Camino led through the city of Ponte Vedra. So the Camino in every city, so it's actually um, in Ponte Vedra, the Camino is the Camino Portugues. So this is the uh, Camino, to, Camino de Santiago that leads up from Porto in Portugal. And um, so this is on the Camino Portugues. And you leave the, uh, the train station and immediately you can see right away, here's where it goes. The Camino in every city is routed to the oldest, most interesting parts of those cities. Um, and so, you know, they've built these um, very modern, it's, it's quite a modern city, actually, um, just adjacent to the very center of the city. So it's quite modern. But I think what is distinctive about it is in that modernness as they rebuilt a lot of the city, perhaps following, you know, I, I don't know, maybe they were hit by the, you know, urban renewal bug like we were. I'm not sure exactly what prompted all of this modernization. But um, even with that, there are very um, wide uh, thoroughfares for uh, pedestrians. It's very well marked. Um, it's comfortable. It's away from the, the car streets, um, the main arterials. And the um, the train is very accessible. The The center of the city is so easy to find. Um, and so it was really quite quite delightful because I think what, what um, Spence Havlick here in Boulder thought about when he visited this place was, oh, we could do this because it feels more American in some ways because of all that modernization. It feels attainable. It feels like, 
okay, you don't have to have all these ancient buildings. You can also build it into, yeah, so this is a good example of that. So these are these modern buildings. And here's um, here's this, this beautiful wide pathway that you can bike on or you can walk on. There's great access to all the multi-use buildings in this area, lots of cafes, lots of interesting shops, lots of apartments. And it led right to the city center where that old church is. So I really appreciated that. I'm glad that I got to go there. And I'm glad that it didn't rain the whole time I was there. It was clear yeah, for no, at least an hour. <laughs> right? It was clear for an hour or so. And then it started yeah. pouring when I, I headed back to the train. But yeah. But, you know, it was it was a great experience. The train ride was only 40 minutes. And so I got a, you know, a wonderful time. And then I I hopped on the train back to Santiago and then I flew um, back to where I was um, traveling home. So that this was my last day in Spain. I'm really glad that you pointed that out. And uh, and, and I had that in instinct of thinking that, you know, there, there's probably many other cities that, you know, have these beautiful, you know, car light uh, and maybe even car free central areas. I think what really resonated for me in reading the stories about Pontevedra was the fact that there was that battle. There was the pushback. There was, you know, there were the people who were, were calling the mayor out and saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And, and he just said, I ran on this platform. If you don't like it, vote me out. And he's, you know, decade after decade, he continues to has been continuing to serve. And 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 I think to to your point is that it, it probably is like, oh, OK, well, this isn't truly special. But what, what is special about this is that there is that an analog of being able to say we can do this in North America, too. Yeah. We just have it to felt have the more familiar. Will. Yeah, yeah, it felt more familiar than some of the other cities. I put a couple other pictures in here of that actually felt a lot like central Denver to me in some ways, because they were, you know, it looked, it had that kind of look and feel of like the 16th Street Mall, you know, which is a pedestrian mall. And so, you know, it, it, but, but, but the difference is that it's so well connected to everything around it, that that pedestrian infrastructure does not stop after 10 blocks. You know, it actually uh, radiates out from the center of the city so that you have access. Now, this is one of the older streets. So, th so there is a lot of ancientness to this place as well. There's the old church, there's the convent, there's the, the, um, you know, the really old places, but this is what felt like Denver to me. I took this picture because I was like, wow, I feel like I'm home, you know? So, um, it, it's got that distinctive, uh, paving, um, and it kind of radiates out in this interesting star pattern where you can, you know, you can go a long way on all of these high streets, you know, shopping streets. And it was very busy. And there were, um, there was a lot going on on the street, which is so exciting. I mean, if nothing else, I just want us to bring street life back. You know, we we had this, we had this at one time. You know, as as urbanists, we want to see our communities reconvene around streets, right? I mean, how amazing will it be? And I know that it will be. We saw this during the, the pandemic that we can do this, right? We can reorient our streets and our street life to facilitate the needs of people every day. And what I love about Europe, wherever I visit, is that those qualities are very concrete. They're very attainable. You, you know, it just feels good to be there without a vehicle because you can get, you know, you can get wherever you need to go. You can learn how to ride transit. You can figure it out, you know, and you can talk to people and you encounter people and you have these wonderful opportunities to engage in social life and to um, just take in the ambiance of a beautiful urban environment. It was a, an incredible treat. Yeah. 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 And, uh, we, we had the opportunity to enjoy some of the ambiance of a, a city yes. street. We did the, the Denver <laughs> city streets together, uh, in July. Yeah. Uh, and that was a, a great deal of fun hanging out with you two, um, down there. Wasn't for, that for, amazing? So. I mean, even in Denver, even on Broadway, this, you know, wide, uh, you know, state highway again, you know, I mean, incredible, right? It, how amazing to remake that for people and to make it intentional. It was so successful and so much fun. And I just want to see more of that. <laughs> At Older Transportation Connections, we've been talking about reviving the, um, 
the green streets and open streets. And so we're on it and we want to partner with you on this. We're going to make it happen. My boss is all about that. So our, our, our director is all about bringing back open streets and as a way to orient people to all the transportation options that we have, but also just to create that social space, you know, that streets as social space. If you don't have that, and if you don't have the placemaking qualities that um, really make streets and places interesting, you're not necessarily gonna choose to travel actively, right? Traveling actively is often predicated on the um, the surrounding environment, the, the quality of the surrounding environment. How interesting is it? How populated is it? How much art and um, how many amenities are there? Because traveling actively takes more time, it takes more effort, but it can be so much more rewarding. So that's what we want to highlight and um, we're we're gonna make it happen. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. That's fantastic, Darcy. Yeah. Thank you so very much. I am so uh, delighted uh, to have you back on the Active Towns podcast. It's been so much fun catching up, and uh, yeah, I can't wait to uh, see what's next in 2024 for you. Absolutely. Me too. And thank you so much, John. I really appreciate our ongoing conversation and um, you inspire me every day. So thank you so much. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you've been enjoying this content and would like to see more, please consider supporting my efforts out on Patreon buy me a coffee, YouTube super thanks, as well as buying things from the Active Town store and making donations to the nonprofit. You can reach all of that just by clicking on the Active Towns website, activetowns.org. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, buy me a coffee, YouTube super thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.